right, folks. We'll get started in a few minutes, a couple of minutes here. Um, all right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Kamesh Pemaraju. I'm a product manager with Dell. Uh, today, I'll be moderating a session with these esteemed guests uh, who know all about OpenStack distributions. So the goal today is for us to understand if, how, and why OpenStack distributions matter for OpenStack, for its adoption, and for future innovation. So that's kind of the, the key um, goal for today's, uh, today's session. Um, so with that, what I'll do is uh, sort of set the stage for some of the dimensions of distributions as I see them, and have the panelists weigh in as we, as we go forward here. So what is a distribution? Is OpenStack project a distribution? OpenStack project is a set of projects that are community developed but they are not a distribution. Because if you're a customer and you want a maintenance patch or a security fix or an update or just support, plain old support, you can go call any of those 400 developers. You gotta have one entity that you can call and say, hey, I have a problem, fix this for me. Install, deploy, fix, maintain, patch. Those are all the things that matter when you're actually dealing with a real OpenStack deployment or an OpenStack production environment. That's where distros come in. So we've seen a lot of this in the Linux world. There are lots of distributions. We have um, Red Hat, SUSE, and Canonical here today who have been leaders in the Linux distribution world, and now they're entering the, the world of OpenStack distributions. So, so I just want to lay out a few dimensions. So a, a distribution can be paid, a commercial distribution and a non-commercial distribution. A distribution could be targeted towards enterprise users or just plain you know, end users that are not enterprise. Um, a distribution could be uh, not all the projects within OpenStack. It could be just some parts of OpenStack. Uh, distribution could be some pieces of it replaced by the vendor with proprietary components. There are lots of different dimensions. So we want to find out today from the panelists about what they're doing with their distributions. Canonical has, a, has a, had had distribution for a long time, ever since, a long time, right? Uh, and then SUSE came up with their OpenStack distribution recently. Red Hat has announced a preview of their distribution. Uh, Dell has a point of view about distributions. And in some ways, um, companies like Piston, Cloud Scaling, um, uh, and we have uh, Morph Labs here, Nebula, also can be thought of as distributions. So we have Morph Labs here as well, who can then provide their, their input or their point of view of what they think was a distribution. So, so with that sort of uh, background, uh, I'm gonna quickly go through and have the panelists introduce themselves, starting with uh, Nick over there on that, that end. And then I'll open up with some questions and it's an open interactive session, so feel free to ask questions along the way. So yeah, I'm Nick Barset, uh, Ubuntu Cloud Product Manager. Um, we've been doing um, packaging and distributing OpenStack since the very beginning. Uh, Joseph George, Director of Product Strategy at Dell. Um, similarly, uh, Dell's been involved in the OpenStack project since day one, uh, and I'm actually quite a few familiar faces there in the crowd. Christopher Adel from Morph Labs. I'm uh, Director of Technology Operations for the company, <clears throat> and we sell a OpenStack appliance. Perry Myers, um, Engineering Manager for Cloud Infrastructure at Red Hat. And uh, we got involved with OpenStack about a year ago and are now just getting into the distribution uh, for Red Hat. I'm Pete Chabot from SUSE once again. We've been uh, participating in OpenStack for about a year now. And as uh, as Kamesh said, we've launched our SUSE cloud distribution just about a month and a half ago. You can see we have some real practitioners in the field who have been involved with OpenStack for more than a year in some cases. Um, so let me kick this off by asking the first question. Why do distributions matter for OpenStack? Uh, anyone want to take that mic? Go ahead and take that one. Sure. So I look at a distribution, and I, and I use this term loosely, and it's because OpenStack is certainly not a museum piece yet. But a distribution is a little bit like a museum where you have a curator that decides which pieces and parts make the most sense for a particular purpose or a particular set of customers. Um, and just as SUSE and Red Hat have been delivering enterprise Linux for a long time, there are differences between SUSE and Red Hat because we see different different capabilities, different um, issues that our customers are trying to solve. So it's our responsibility to sort of look at the world of, of uh, packages that are out there, uh, figure out which ones work best for a, a specific uh, use case or a specific set of customers, and then deliver that. 
Uh, so for example, if you're using cloud, not only will it bring OpenStack, but you can also bring in um, the bundle gate um, crowbar to make it easier to install and to read things. And then we'll incorporate other parts of that into the service as well. Yeah, I agree with uh, everything you said there. I, I'll also highlight that one of the things we do as distributions is make things more of a solution rather than just a piece of component parts, right? So you can think of the upstream OpenStack projects um, as you know, building blocks, and what we want to do is give something that's a little more turnkey for our customers. And it's not just about providing additional software, for example, like Crowbar, but also about providing tuning, uh, performance, um, working with vendors to do certification, and also the amount of testing that we put into the distribution. And then uh, maintaining things as you go through the life cycle, because customers are not going to want to update, you know, every on the six month cadence that we have with uh, the upstream right now. So being able to support something for an extended period of time and deal with things like security updates and so forth. So my perspective is really, I agree with those guys completely, um, and the distribution should be a stable snapshot of a project. And with OpenStack, it's so active and, and being developed so quickly and moving so quickly, there's a real, real fine balance point in finding, in defining what your version of OpenStack is, so which tags of each individual components are going into your your deployment of OpenStack. And so for us, there's it's really important, and we, we use uh, Ubuntu, and we count on their repositories. Um, it's We, we count on a, a particular point-in-time version of OpenStack for each deployment. So in, in some sense, uh, what you guys are doing at Morph Labs, it's not like a traditional distribution. You're taking an existing distribution and then creating a specialized solution for your customers. Exactly. Which is which can be thought of as a, as a solution, right? Right. It's a, I mean, it's a customized solution. Exactly, yeah. and it's our solution is meant to be consumed really as an appliance. So we're on the hook for making sure that OpenStack works properly. And in order for us to do that, it's if we go at our own and try and roll our own build of OpenStack every single time, we would need a pretty big uh, group of engineers just focused on that, whereas we can rely on, on, on the canonical guys to do it right and give us a really stable base on which to build everything else we offer on top of. Um, from the Dell perspective, um, obviously everybody on this stage is a partner of Dell's. Um, and our, our goal um, has always been to deliver solutions to customers. Uh, and as you can imagine, we have a wide variety of, of customers that we try to service um, on a number of different technologies. And so we, we feel that uh, what distributions uh, bring to the table is actually really critical for customers and their expectations of support, validation, et cetera. Uh, when you look at what Dell has brought to, brought to market, the, uh, the Dell OpenStack powered cloud solution, made up of an RA and the Dell's Crowbar software that we developed, plus the you know, software from various partners, um, and then services on top of that, um, you know, we're, we're designing a solution that customers can get, drop in their environment, start uh, you know, finding value off of. And uh, you know, just recently announced today, uh, we announced a relationship uh, with Morph Labs in delivering their solution because, uh, as I mentioned, um, what Morph is doing in this space, Morph Labs is doing in this space, is actually servicing a specific part of our customer segment as well. So we view distributions as pretty critical to uh, our customer base and what they find uh, as important um, in a cloud solution. Yeah, um, I think it would be hard to add to everything that has been said because I fully agree <laughs> on everything, <laughs> but I think there is... Uh, there is twofold uh, in the role of a distribution. There is the uh, the fold where we distribute something to people, and when we do so, we have to make choices. OpenStack is a project which is the world of choice. You start deploying OpenStack, and then you already have, oh, am I going to use Rabbit, Cupid, or ZeroMQ? Am I going to be using KVM, Xen, Hyper-V, name it, etc., uh, etc. Et so. One of our role is to test a subset of this, make choices for you to make your life more simple, uh, and then package it and deliver it in uh, a way that you can consume it and deploy it as easily as possible. But there is also another fold. It's our involvement with the OpenStack community. Um, each of us here are here because not only do we consume OpenStack, but do we, uh, we also help shape the future of OpenStack, because we are in contact with a lot of customers uh, who m may not have the possibility to join this effort, and we are their advocate toward the community. 
and sometimes building the solutions that the open source community had not thought of to deliver the solution that our customer wants. Great, thank you. So, so there's a, there's an interesting uh, set of thoughts about OpenStack being the Linux of the cloud. And I think it was Martin Mikos who famously said at one of the conferences, it's not gonna be Linux of the cloud, it'll become the Unix of the cloud. Uh, so in, in essence, what he was saying was, the danger is that OpenStack can become fragmented, right? Everybody has their own flavor, everybody starts forking, forking things off. So I wanted to get some sense from the panelists today is OpenStack the Linux of the cloud, or is it going to become the Unix of the cloud? What are your thoughts? It's clear. I mean, it's obviously, uh, apart from a, a few customers that made a wrong choices at the very beginning of OpenStack, didn't understand the philosophy of open source and deployed OpenStack the wrong way. But apart from these guys, I think nobody here are making the same mistake. When we want something in OpenStack, it either talks to the official API or it's inside of OpenStack uh, developed with the community as a full project. So the fragmentation is um, something that Martin Mikos may like because it, it <laughs> helps him sell his solution, um, but it doesn't exist. So that happens only if somebody decides to fork OpenStack and create their own distribution and not go back and contribute back to the core, right? So what, do you, what, what are you guys seeing in, in that space? Well, i just like to add one thing on there. I mean, there's the notion of core projects, and I think we're all consistent with the idea of contributing back to the community, and in fact, working first with the community and pulling back into the, the product, right? But there is gonna be, I think, a little bit of divergence when we talk about um, things that layer on top of OpenStack. Like, we've got different management solutions, we've got different monitoring solutions, and so forth, and so you might see a little bit of um, fragmentation there. And But at the same time, there are, are you know, that, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but. Um, but there are other projects that are, you know, coming up in the works, right? And things that are hit, heading towards incubation. And so I think there's opportunities for us to at least have the same core infrastructures for those things, even if our UIs, for example, are different, because that's kind of cosmetic. Yeah, yeah. Well, as long as the, as long as the foundation is healthy and, and we keep having, you know, regular design summits like this and keeping the community together, <clears throat> it won't fragment because it's, it's one group of people, like Nick said, building it. And, you know, there's, it's a great foundation where the people who do want to do their own thing can build, you know, the plugins or the side projects that communicate through the core API. So there's the ability for people to kind of go off on their own and add their own unique feature sets. But there, the core foundation is, I think, always going to be OpenStack. I don't think it, there's ever going to be some some weird fork. And, and, and I think just to, just to address sort of the, the fundamental question <coughs> is distribution does not equal core. white space, if you will, around the solution to add value without without changing the underlying architecture. So there's, if there's an opportunity for you to ask questions, feel free. I have one question, which is uh, you guys have distributions of your own. Can you spend a quick one minute describing why your distribution is different, why it's important, what are you trying to do, wh what problems are you trying to solve? <coughs> yeah, go ahead, please, go ahead. Absolutely. Uh, it's not there is going to be. There is. The OpenStack API is already there. It's made, made to evolve, but it's ma made so that your management solution can know that it has evolved. There is versioning inside of the API. And if you make a proprietary component or a fork component that is not part of the core, as long as you talk with the API, there is no risk. You're not going to be forking OpenStack. You're going to be enhancing OpenStack in your own way. Yeah, there's a question. In the 
one thing I'll add is that just like with Linux and the base distributions we're talking about, that diversity actually helps the ecosystem, right? So it's not a bad thing that there's, you know, SUSE and Canonical and Red Hat all together because we're all independently helping and we're all helping to drive different facets of it. Other questions? Yeah. I think, I think there are tools that make that relatively straightforward to deal with, um, and, and there's certainly a lot of, lot of third-party applications that run on all platforms, so I don't think it's that big a problem. I mean, I don't see how um, what you're saying is true. Uh, today, the way you describe an image that is running on top of Office Dart is the same, exactly the same, regardless of the distribution of Office Dart, so that you're using the same API. So you can very well save that image and run it somewhere else. It will run the same way. But there, there is one difference, though, which is um, each distribution focuses on maybe a different set of hypervisors. And there are image differences be, be going from one hypervisor to another. And like you said, there are tools that you can use to convert an image from one hypervisor to another. So when you talk about you know, workloads, um, let's say you, know, it, it, you have an application, and maybe it only runs on RHEL, doesn't happen to run on SUSE. That does, you can take that same image, even though it's a RHEL image, and run it on top of SUSE's cloud. There's no reason you can't do that. So uh, that's one way you can transition the workloads. But again, if you're going from one hypervisor to another, there's a little bit of a manual step there, but there are a lot of tools to help automate that. So that, that's what I wanted to get to my next section about. So what is that REST? So this, you know, Susa, let's start with you. What, how do you describe your distro, OpenStack distro? How is it different? What's unique about it? So, so I think, uh, first of all, um, as we've talked about at the beginning, you know, it's built upon OpenStack. It's built upon OpenStack Essex. We've, we made, just like everybody else on this, on this panel, we made enhancements as part of the process for the original OpenStack distro. So we're not differentiating at all in those respects. Um, a couple areas that we focused on was Zen. A lot of our customers actually run Zen. Zen is a hypervisor. So we did a lot of work to make sure Zen was supportable at the same level as KVM in Essex. Again, you, you should go on that back history. A um, couple of other areas where we focused was hardening. Um, you know, as Gary said earlier, that's one of the really key pieces. The key pieces of distribution is, is making sure we're doing additional levels of testing on GitHub, on Essex when it goes, when it goes GA. Uh, and then we bundled in with Crowbar, worked with Dell, some other partners to make sure that it's easy for the process to install and use on those sites. Uh, so a Red Hat um, OpenStack distribution is, I would say, based pretty much vanilla from upstream, so very similar to what you're talking about. Uh, you know, we basically take the upstream releases, um, package it, harden it, and go through Fedora first. So when you think about distributions, you can kind of think about there's the, and you mentioned this earlier, there's the product distribution, but then there's also free open source distributions. And so we treat Fedora as the upstream that we pull into both RHEL and into OpenStack. Um, what we've specifically done, uh, and again, everything we do gets pushed upstream, but we've focused on things like KVM as the hypervisor, making sure that works really well for us with our versions of KVM, uh, making sure it ties really well into libvirt to help support that. And you know, th some of the other things we did had to do with like uh, AMQP messaging layer, right? Originally, RabbitMQ was the only supported one, so we pulled that out, abstracted it, and uh, made Cupid work. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot of other kind of smaller things that we did, um, but fundamentally, everything that we did was upstream, pull it in, and now what we're focusing on is um, making it easier for use for the enterprise, right? So, making it easier to deploy, install, monitor. You know, our initial release is going to be pretty vanilla compared to upstream Folsom, but uh, as we mature things, we'll add in those additional monitoring and deployment capabilities. So, are you guys focused on the enterprise, particularly? I mean, both Suits and Red Hat? Uh, yeah. Or are you, are you looking at uh, Calcos and service providers and such? We, we consider those part of the enterprise as well, okay, which is a okay. different aspect of the enterprise. Okay. All right. So our distribution is fundamentally different because we are selling it to customers as an appliance. <clears throat> so they don't need to know how to set
set up OpenStack. They don't even need to know about the internals if they don't want to. Um, we're based on Ubuntu. We, uh, we use Puppet after, after we deploy for all the configuration management. But essentially what the customer gets is a running, supported OpenStack um, environment that they can access through our UI, which is one of the other big differentiating factors. We're not using Horizon. We developed our own UI and we used um, the Fog API. So we gave back to the Fog community in hopes of bringing more Ruby developers into the OpenStack fold. Um, and we, we actively, we're active contributors to Fog API. Um, and our, our UI talks to OpenStack through uh, the Fog API. Um, and the, but the customers have access to directly the OpenStack API. So if they, if they, if they are you know, fairly technically literate and they want to manage their OpenStack environment, via the API, they have full access to that. And if they are just trying to get their feet wet in cloud, we've really lowered the barrier of entry and let them, you know, give them a really um, easy to use web interface to manage and launch um, and take care of VMs. Are you uh, targeting a specific set of uh, market segment or? We're, or yeah, we're targeting specifically people who could use cloud. Okay. <laughs> who could use cloud, yeah, that's yes. it. <laughs> you know, if a marketing guy said that, you would destroy him, if you know that, right? So, um, yeah, the Dell perspective is, uh, you know, very unique. In addition to the partner offering that we sell with uh, with Morph, Morph Labs, um, you know, we don't, um, our, the distribution, and then we know we could get into the various colors of what the word distribution actually means. Um, but, you know, we deliver an, a crowbar ISO that we actually uh, make available that includes uh, right now the Ubuntu bits uh, that we deploy OpenStack on. But again, it, to us, it's a very similar thing, right? And we are focused right now uh, in our solution on the Dell OpenStack uh, Power Cloud solution on the more, a more sophisticated user, one that does want the flexibility and the power that comes with an open source uh, type product. Uh, but then as we look into other places and we start looking at uh, getting into other markets, it's going to be important for us to get into those spaces as well. And I'm going to suggest that you start with Nick on the next question because you seem to be <laughs> <laughs> favoring that side of the line there. Yeah. So our specificity is that we are targeting um, the users that need to deploy OpenStack at a very large scale. Um, we have a, a unique tool, Juju, which is weird enough so that it can deploy the cloud and deploy on the cloud. And this gives us a very nice uh, way to make sure that we can automate all the testing to ensure that the upstream bits that we receive are always functioning on a continuous basis. And we've invested a lot of effort in making this continui con continuous integration uh, effort the main way through which we ensure the quality and the enterprise readiness of our OpenStack distribution. Through uh, Juju, not only can we test the deployment of OpenStack, but we can test also that we can still deploy on OpenStack with the same result, measuring how uh, we are improving or decreasing performance. That said, there is another role that we think we have that is very important, is building a, trust ecos a trusted ecosystem. A, a number, having a number of partners with whom we know we can build an OpenStack cloud together. Because as good as we are, we only have a piece of the complete puzzle. The networking problem is something where you need to partner with people. And depending on your need, finding the right partner and making sure that this right partner works correctly with you is something very important. The same thing happened for storage. Maybe you want very fast IOPS. Maybe you want very cheap storage. Which partner should you go to? This is what we work on. This is what we want to work on right now. Great. Um, so I think we'll start with the next question. A great segue into the, my next question, which is one of the things I've been following OpenStack for the last two years. And this time around, I think we are at a crucial inflection point. We're seeing a separate parallel user track, which never existed before. And uh, we're also seeing um, lots of interest amongst users to start moving their workloads into quote unquote production. So my next question is around you know, how, what are you doing with your distributions or the way you're coming to market around enabling customers to move into quote unquote production? What does that mean for your customers? If you can elaborate. So um, going to production depends on, on, on what customer you're talking about. If you're talking about uh, 
guy that is deploying private cloud, enterprise, his main concern going to production is not going to be the cloud itself. It's going to be the or the list of applications that he expects to be running on his cloud, or the list of developers that he expects uh, being enabled by the cloud. Well, when we are talking to a public cloud provider, his expectation is how quickly can I build my customers? Um, so going to production is a very subtle uh, mix of needs. What do we support? How can it be implemented? How can it be uh, integrated with the existing backbone of the, of the enterprise, whether it's the provider backbone for selling and billing stuff, or it is the identity backbone of the enterprise. And therefore, I don't think there is a, a generic case of going into production. Every time it's something a little bit specific that needs to take into account the DNA of the enterprise. So, so what about things like high availability, fault tolerance? Is that a requirement for going into production in your opinion? Oh, obviously. <laughs> yeah, right. So there's, I mean, a, there's a base set of things that don't exist today. There is no HA in, in core OpenStack. But there is no, uh, uh, there is nothing that prevents from building an HA OpenStack inside of OpenStack. Right. In fact, there is, there was two components that were causing uh, ma massive headaches. This has recently been reduced to one. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the, the complexity of putting OpenStack in HA is something that uh, a good sysadmin should be able to handle very easily. That's like saying that Linux has no HA. I mean, there's yeah. components that provide HA and you yeah. integrate them with, uh, with OpenStack. So things like Pacemaker, for example, could be used to do that. And so then you I have to look at HA both from the, um, the guest perspective and also from the underlying service perspective too. So my question is related to distribution, whether or not distributions themselves provide those kind of HA capabilities out of the box. Is that something you guys are thinking about? This is something that yeah. we are more than think thinking about. This yeah. is something that we are building into our Juju joint. Okay. Um, it's, it's a configuration option, and it's what it comes down to. Yeah. HA for OpenStack is just configuration. Our, our goal is that with Juju, you deploy, and you do Juju add unit and your HA, period. Yeah. Yeah. I would Other? just say um, my perspective on it is similar, but uh, you know we kind of treat it more in a layered fashion. So there, there's one aspect of HA in OpenStack is the fact that the services are all horizontally scalable, right? So if you want high availability, you make sure you have load balancers, you make sure you horizontally scale your services. Another aspect is the you know automated health check and restart from services. And for that, you know we have um, solutions at Red Hat, uh, Red Hat high availability software, and you can pair those two together. So we don't look at that as being part of the OpenStack distribution, we look at that as being part of the overall solution. So if you want that, you get those two components, you, you know, we'll, we'll have white papers that will show how to operate those together, and that will provide the desired So it's a services driven thing. type of thing? Yeah. Then, okay. Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. If, I, if I could just add to the, the original question, the customers that we see who are looking for uh, production deployments um, are looking for exactly the same thing that they look for when they do a production deployment on Linux. Because at the end of the day, when you actually launch the workload, it's running on Slez is good, Xander KVM is running on Realm, is Xander KVM. OpenStack is that actually not part of the execution stack, it's part of the management stack. So customers are looking for certification on hardware, they're looking for certified applications that they can migrate to the cloud, and those are all things that are, that are inherently part of the enterprise ecosystem. Yeah, and, and to add on, on to that, I think this is really good discussion. When we, when we take our perspective and kind of where, where Nick was going, um, you know, what about networking and what about storage? And, and these, are the, these are the exact conversations that we want to have with our customers that we're actually, uh, you know, that we are having on a regular basis, which is, you know, when you actually go from a proof of concept, which, um, you know, there's certain infrastructure that you need in place, uh, there's certain expectations around the software that you're putting out there. And we're not, we're not really finding that customers, it's, it's a, that it's a stop at POC and then go buy a, a production environment. A lot of our customers are starting with POCs and buying POC units, and then evolving into a production environment where uh, they may not need, uh, you know, a SAN right up front. But when they want to get in production, they're going to want to have something in that in that type. Um, so it's actually really an interesting evolution. It it also ties back to where where OpenStack is, right, in its own evolution. Um, and as you know, as you indicated, this conference is a great indicator of of, of where OpenStack is growing. And as we start seeing more and more of these types of very strenuous requirements coming in, 
I think we start finding our finding ourselves in the production environment, and then you know that that's really where we're all headed. We do want to get OpenStack as a technology in production environments. I'll open up the floor for questions in a, in a second. I have one question, one last question for the panel. Um, so in terms of where you see this going in the future, so sort of a paint a visionary picture of where you see each of you guys see from a from your company perspective, next three to five years. Where do you see OpenStack going? Where do you see your distributions going? One minute. Each. So that's a, a great question. And see, I can be sure that I will be wrong in my forward-looking <laughs> statement. <laughs> but uh, clearly, uh, I don't see any reason why uh, the OpenStack layer will not become the standard layer on which every application runs in the future. As we are building more and more functionality into OpenStack, there is less and less reason to run on straight bare metal. I'm saying straight because you can run on bare metal through OpenStack. Uh, and therefore, I think this this will really become our common kernel. And we'll still be delivering the real kernel underneath. And we'll still be uh, uh, delivering kernel inside. But every operation that your IS will have to do, except for maintaining the bare metal infrastructure will be completely virtualized in a way where their actual operation will be delegated to the people using that actual the, the infrastructure. Uh, by the way, I think there's a great foreshadowing to the presidential debate tonight, by the way, giving <laughs> us one minute. This would be interesting to see what's going to happen. Yeah, but essentially three to five years, you know, again, to go back to something I said earlier, um, you know, our, the, the Dell customer base is, is varied. And there's a unique uh, set of needs that come with a bunch of different markets. Uh, and where we, where I, where I see this going in three to five years, and, and in the space that we, that Kamesh and I are a part of, uh, we are also the team that's working on Hadoop solutions. Um, obviously, what we're developing with Crowbar, we've developed an open source community. So what we're seeing is, I, I believe, is more and more appetite and interest and adoption in, in open source in general. And I think that will help drive where OpenStack is going to go. I, I agree with Nick. We're going to all be wrong if we put some bold statements out there. Um, but all I being think recorded, by the way. Yeah, I know. That are going to be recorded. <laughs> They're going to be shown right in, in, in next year when we're all wrong. Yeah. Uh, but I think what's, what's going to be happening is we're going to see uh, more and more of the enterprise start adopting a little bit more uh, appetite for open source technologies. That being said, there I, b I believe there's going to be a market for existing cl cloud technologies as well. I believe there's going to be a market for all of these things. Uh, OpenStack offers us a venue to kind of a new space that customers that have the needs that are that are met by OpenStack will be able to help meet. Okay, thank you. I agree with uh, one minute what, with what Nick said, and I think OpenStack is going to become the de facto standard when it comes to delivering infrastructure as a service. And uh, like Nick was saying, people will stop thinking so much about hardware. There will still be people whose jobs it is to maintain that hardware, but the end users are really not going to worry about it. The hardware is going to become more and more deeply extracted, uh, uh, abstracted, the networking as well. And I think OpenStack is going to be the technology that brings that to the people and kind of takes everything else out. So there will be, there will always be uh, competitors and smaller, smaller people doing the cloud stuff. But I think OpenStack is going to become the kind of the, the go-to standard. So I'll go out on a limb and, and make the statement that none of you guys wanted to make the statement. <laughs> OpenStack will be the only cloud in five years. No. We can all hope, right? Um, no, I'm, I'm sure that uh, it'll take a little bit longer for that, maybe six, seven years. Um, so I, I agree fundamentally with you, what you guys are saying, and I like the analogy that you brought up earlier of OpenStack being like Linux. And I think just like, you know, speaking specifically to Red Hat OpenStack, um, you know, initially we have a huge amount of churn. We have a lot of uh, features being added. And just like we had with Red Hat Enterprise Linux over 10 years ago, um, the support model has evolved, right? So initially you have people that are on a very short uh, support cadence. And so I think three to five years from now, what we're going to see is a stabilization and you know, maturity of, of OpenStack-based clouds so that you know, customers can stay on something for a prolonged period of time. So eventually you get to the point where you're, you're th actually thinking about, hey, I want to be on a particular release of OpenStack for five years. Now, when you take a look at today with Folsom, does anyone think that you could be on Folsom five years from now? <laughs> Probably not. But we want to get to that point, and that's what we're really all driving towards. So I think, uh, obviously, I'm not going to say that in three to five years, OpenStack is not going to be successful, because who knows? <laughs> <laughs> then I don't need a job anymore, I guess. So, so I guess my, my vision, three to five years, you're all, you're an enterprise, you're running an infrastructure, you're going to have more than 
more than one hypervisor running in your infrastructure for a variety of reasons. Uh, applications will be certified on VMware, applications will be certified on Zen, applications will be certified on Hyper-V, but you don't want to manage it through one control plane. That control plane is going to be OpenStack. So you'll be able to have OpenStack set up and, 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 and send off a workload to run on Hyper-V, set off a workload to run on VMware, but you see everything through that single infusion class. And that's and 70% of your workloads are going to be running that way. You might have 25, 30% just in doing bare metal. I doubt there's going to be very much that can be managed on a, on, a, on a standalone version of using existing virtualization management technologies. Um, and I do believe uh, that not only does OpenStack become the, the Linux of the cloud, the question is who becomes the CPM of the cloud. Uh, <laughs> All right, with that, we'll open it up for the questions from the floor. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So I think it's just like Linux today. I mean, you'll always be able to migrate. Um, and, but if you're using a specific set of tools that's in one distribution and it's not in a different distribution, you're going to have to you're going to have to migrate at least at the tool set level. But from an API level, you should be fine. Yeah, I would just say that the, the whole point of having a core OpenStack set of APIs is that that allows you to not have vendor lock-in at that level. And it, if you have lock-in at the tools, that's a different situation. But um, I think that as long as we're all focused on working upstream first, so if you're going to work with, you know, Canonical to get a feature upstream, it's going upstream, and so therefore Red Hat will also benefit from that same feature. I know this oversimplifies OpenStack, but a reasonable analogy is think about Apache. If you're going to run Apache on Red Hat or Apache on Ubuntu, if you're running Apache 2.2, you're running Apache, and, and your HTML and CSS and everything behind that is is going to be, you can migrate it from one Apache uh, under any distribution you want to the other. Yeah, and, and I'll just briefly say, right before we hand it over to Canonical here, um, I think it's within our power as a community to help influence this as well, right? That's 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 what's unique about what we're doing here in this in this moment is, um, you know, there are decisions that all the great partners on this stage are making, but we as a community have a voice to actually let the, let these vendors know how we want to see these implemented. So yeah, uh, I don't see any reason why when we are talking about the same version of OpenStack, there shouldn't be a point of compatibility. Uh, in fact, uh, and I'm quite sure when um, you mentioned earlier uh, that you could have a single control app for multiple hypervisors, um, these hypervisors are going to be run on different OSs, and it's one open stack. So only this is proving that we don't really want to put in any blockers to manage multiple different distribution of hypervisor and therefore distribution of open stack. Yeah, we have uh, time for maybe two questions. And I think one one or two persons answer that, that'd be good. talking to each of us. Um, customer in production, uh, it's in the range of 50, about. Yeah, and, and we'd, we'd have to be, Dell has to be more yeah. careful in, in saying some of these numbers, but yeah, we have we actually have a variety of customers in all these different stages uh, of de de deployment right now. I, um, not being on the marketing team, I'm hesitant to ever <laughs> say a number. You can we say have any many customers. Then. We work with a lot of uh, service providers, and so for the service providers, they white label what what we build and support. So they've also deployed it. And if the if the heart of the question is how many people are using OpenStack, it's um, it's it, the number is growing every day, and it's I, I can't give you a number. 
<laughs> we don't have a, pr a full product out yet, so we don't have customers in production, but we are working with a handful of, of Lighthouse customers, we're calling them, to get them to production quickly so that when we do have a uh, GA release of the Red Hat OpenStack product, that they'll be ready to go out the door. Um, I'm also not in marketing, so I'm not going to throw a number out because my <laughs> marketing guys will hit me over the head. <laughs> We've been we've been in the market for about a month and a half, and we've got a number of uh, uh, proof of concept lighthouse customer kinds of kinds of activities going on. We have not uh, uh, divulged any specific production numbers, but yeah. certainly we've got. We're just about out of time, so thank you very much, panel members, for your <laughs> contributions.